there we go. So today's class is called How to Destroy the World. And I should probably explain a little bit as to what we mean by that. Seems rather destructive. Like, no, this is not a class on some anarcho-Marxist political theory. No, none of that. Um, here's what we're interested in doing today. First, we should note that Shiva is often called the destroyer. Hello, Toasty. <laughs> so why is Shiva called the destroyer? Now, in the trinity of divinities that we find in South Asian spirituality, hello, Toasty, welcome. <laughs> what a cute name, Toasty. Now, in the trinity of divinities that we found find in South Asian spirituality, we have three Three of them, duh. In a trinity, we have three. The first one is Brahma, who is seen as the creator of the cosmos. So Brahma is the creator deity. Secondarily, not secondarily, secondly, we have Vishnu, who is the preserver or the maintainer. And thirdly, we have Shiva, who is the destroyer, the dissoluter, the dissolver. Now, you could say that if you look at nature, there are three functions happening throughout all of nature. The first is generation. Things are coming into existence. Um, then there is a period of maintenance, a period of order in which certain life processes, certain laws of physics, certain scientific, chemical, and biological processes are going on to maintain order. So if you look at a cat, for instance, like a little kitten was born, it, it, it comes into being. And then for the period of that cat's life, it is sustained by internal processes of order, processes of order. So you could say the cat is a temporary, um, temporary safeguard against the entropy of the universe. Well, the cat is an ordered being. And when the cat is hungry, the cat eats. And there's like a system there, an ordered system, whereby the cat knows where to get his food or her food. The cat knows how to digest their food, you know, um, all of that. The cat knows to sleep when it's sleepy. And the cat is equipped with a whole set of instincts and, 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 and you know, it just knows how to get around in the world and protect itself from danger, etc. So there's some principle, some principle of order operating throughout all of life and throughout all of nature that keeps things in existence. After they come into existence, this principle of order keeps them in existence. And then most importantly, you could say there is a principle that dissolves it all in the end. Death is a part of life. In fact, it's the most important part of life. When you lose your loved ones, that's ultimately what makes those relationships with your loved ones sweet. They're not eternal relationships. They won't last forever. Like a rose, if it was an artificial rose that lasted forever, it wouldn't be that beautiful. But a living, vibrant rose is beautiful insofar as it's going to die. Oh, that's the beauty of the rose. There's a mortality to the rose. And as such, you don't take it for granted. There is a temporality to it. And somehow, through that temporality, you can glimpse something eternal. What's eternal is not the rose. What's eternal is the principle of life out of which a million roses come, in which a million roses sit, and into which a million roses ultimately dry up, blacken, decay, and corrode. So that function then of destroying, of dissolving, of ending is Shiva, typically in the trinity of, of divinities in South, Asia, Southeast, South, South Asian spirituality. So Shiva is the destroyer. Now notice, death is very important for birth. It's very important for value, for finding meaning in things. But not only that, it's also incredibly important in the creative process. You've got to spring clean and Marie Kondo your house, get rid of a whole bunch of stuff before new energy can come in. You know, new opportunities, vibrancy, like life comes usually as a result of ending things. Um, maybe you end a relationship that wasn't serving you and now your life is full of joy and possibility and delight. There's so many things that you can go out and experience and do and all of that, you know, thanks to dissolving that relationship. You might quit a job that you never really enjoyed. And then suddenly life is full of possibility. Oh, I can move to Spain and start up anew over there. I have a friend who actually did that. She wasn't very happy in LA. Um, and she just decide, decided one day in the midst of it all to just get up and leave. And she's happier than she's ever been living her life in Spain, you know, exploring spirituality and, and all of that. And that option is available to all of us. We can just right now, if we decided up and leave and start a new life somewhere, you know, we can end this one not to promote spiritual bypassing or escapism or anything, but just to say here that ending, dying, destroying, dissolving, these are all very important parts of life and they make room for what is to come next. So if you look at these three processes, they seem to be three distinct processes, but they're actually all part of one process, life. 
life living itself. Life does these three things. So if you take the word God, you can break it up to these three letters, G, O, and D. G, you could say is generation. O is operation. And D is destruction. The three principles then of God are to create, generate, to maintain, to operate, and to destroy. So then Vishnu, Shiva, Brahma, these are not three different things, three different entities, each of them with their particular task in their office. No, there are three aspects of one thing, which we can call reality, capital R. You can choose to call it life. You can choose to call it God, capital G, um, the self, uh, Brahman. In our tradition, in Tantra, we call it Shiva. So Shiva both refers to one of the three, but also refers to all three together. So, you know, whatever you want to call it, these three functions, creating, maintaining, and destroying, are all part of this one divinity. And the claim of non-duality is that that very divinity is your own essence nature. There is a complete identity between you and that divinity. So today, in our class today, I want to focus on like the Shiva aspect. Now, in Tantra, um, and remember, Tantra is a spiritual movement that emerges within Shaivism, the religion devoted to Shiva, that kind of emerged around the 5th century AD, though it has roots to like pre-Vedic civilization, you know, way before 1900 BCE. But anyway, we say, okay, Tantra emerged out of Shaivism and later spread into Buddhism and Vaishnavism and Jainism and uh, Indian Muslim, Islam and all that. Like before any of that, before Tantra spread into these other traditions, Tantra was largely a, a practice devoted to the god Shiva and Shakti. So Shiva Shakti, right? They're the main focus of Tantra. So today I really want to talk to you about Shiva in his role as the destroyer. And I want to make a case for that very role being your own power to dissolve the world. You know, so without any further ado, let's get into it. So that, that's all preamble. The idea of like a trinity of God, the Trimurti. Hello, dear Angela, who has a tattoo of the Trimurti. <laughs> we we're just talking about the Trimurti. So the preamble, just to catch Angela up, is as follows. Uh, three aspects of God. G, generation. O, operation. D, destruction. Typically, in Hindu iconography, Brahma is the creator deity. It's often given the attribute of Rajas, you know, it's always active, building stuff. And then Vishnu is given the attribute Sattva because Vishnu is an ordered principle. It's the principle of order that keeps everything kind of functioning and running. And then you've got the Tamasika aspect, you could say Shiva. A traditional Orthodox Hindu might say this, okay, Shiva, Kali, they represent the Tamasika aspect of divinity because they destroy and funnily enough, we were just talking, Angela, about like roses and what makes roses beautiful. So it's nice that you're here. But we we're making a case for like the end of the rose is what gives the rose its eternal, eternal, eternal nature. It's the rose that is not eternal. It's what caused the rose to come in what in that the rose sits. And that's what's eternal about it. But the rose needs to die for us to appreciate that. Otherwise, an eternal rose would just be a block to the eternality behind all form. An eternal form would occlude the constantly shifting dynamic dance of Shakti. You know, oh, look at the cat. Just <laughs> Hello, Deborah. <laughs> so, you know, it's true that like a while ago, if you see Shiva as this Tamasika destroyer aspect, then some of that will be maintained in Tantra. And Tantra, of course, she sees Shiva as all three. Shiva being God, capital G, the creator, the maintainer, the destroyer. But in our iconography, in our philosophy, in our poetry, we're kind of goth in this way because we, we enjoy Shiva and his destroyer aspect. You know, so today we're, our class is called How to Destroy the World. And so let's get into it. We say Shiva destroys the world. You know, at the end of every creation, every cycle um, for like however long that cycle goes on for, Shiva dissolves it all back, like sucks it all in or, you know, starts a fire and the whole thing is dissolved in this fire of Shiva. And, and, you know, iconographically, he's dancing throughout this whole process. Shiva or Kali, they're reeling drunk under the spell of some divine ecstasy. And in their drunken dance, they're like stomping on cosmos, swatting entire solar systems uh, out of the sky. And, and they're ripping it all to shreds. They're taking time and space and ripping time and space and causality all to shreds. And every soul in existence loses its form 
all tamas, rajas, and sattva are all withdrawn back into divinity. And so you would lose the body, the mind, and, and any world that you might be in, whether you're a Gandharva in Gandharva Loka, you know, the, the sphere of the musical beings, or if you're a Deva in, in like a Deva Loka, a godly heavenly realm, you know, there are 118 of these Bhuvanas or realms, you know, and, and you could say Vedically, there are seven heaven realms, seven hell realms, like all of that. Wherever you might be in this spectrum of creation, when Shiva starts to dance, the Tandava, his dance of destruction, you're all called home. And you enter into a kind of seed state, kind of like deep sleep, where you're aware, but aware of an absence. There's nothing to be aware of. And you are just like a seed. And you await the next creation, kind of like the limbo in Christianity. Anyway, you await that creation that starts again. Brahma starts it all up again. And then you as a seed sprout into whatever body body form you're going to have. And you go through your journey of sadhana, etc. So even the gods do sadhana. Even they are trying to get to higher planes and ultimately transcend. So anyway, all of this is going on. This is kind of the traditional Hindu picture of Shiva as the destroyer. Now we're going to discuss Tantra. So in Tantra, especially in non-dual Tantra, we take all of these like mythologies and creation myths and all of that, and we internalize it. We say these myths and stories are not really detailed depictions of like cosmic processes or gods out there. Really, they're metaphors for internal processes of consciousness that are happening in each and every moment. So the Garden of Eden then is not some fall that happened like some long time ago and now we're all suffering for it. The Garden of Eden is, a, is an event that happens in every single cognition. The moment you become more interested in your fictional idea of who you think you are, that's the fall. You lose the innocence and purity of wandering wide-eyed in the garden, totally unconscious of the self. Once you become self-conscious, once you become interested in your separate identity, then you feel your own nakedness and your own vulnerability. You know, so the nakedness that Adam and Eve were enjoying in the garden, you know, which was their kind of openness to life, suddenly became their vulnerability. And they're like, <gasps> you know, and that's how we feel like we're in this world, we're alone. We're estranged, we're alienated, and we look around and we see all these other people and things that we want, things that we don't want. So insofar as in a cognition, you identify with the thought, you or me or my story, that's the fall. So it's not something that happened, it's something that's continuously happening. So similarly, in just that same way, in order to understand non-dual tantra, you have to see all these metaphors, like all these stories as like de de depictions of conscious processes happening in each and every moment. So we're going to do a guided meditation now, um, focusing on Shiva's aspect as the destroyer. And in other words, focusing on your own ability to dissolve and destroy the world that you see around you. So let's begin. Now, you can do this meditation in one of three ways. You can sit in a cross-legged posture, you know, sitting upright with the head, spine, and neck all in alignment. You can do this meditation lying down. So you might prefer to simply come and take Shavas in a corpse pose which is the pose that Shiva takes when Kali is dancing on him. Or you might just sit in a chair with your feet flat on the ground, with your hands in your lap or something, you know, you're welcome to sit uh, or lie down comfortably. All right. And we'll do this meditation in four parts. So there are four steps in destroying the world. I should probably say three. Well, there are three spokes in Shiva's trident. And there are three worlds, the, the gross, the subtle, and the causal. Three gunas, the tamas, the rajas, and the sattva. So traditionally, it's three, but I, just for the purposes of this class, I'm going to say four. Four stages to destroy the world. So let's begin. I'll open with some mantras to Shiva. And then we'll come into our meditation. And I'll walk you through these four stages. And we'll see together how this world can be destroyed. Then from meditation, we'll do some Hatha Yoga, a few poses here and there. And then we'll come back into meditation to revisit this idea of Shiva as the destroyer. Okay. Or you as the destroyer. So let's take our seat. If you're sitting upright, see to it that your spine is long and your chest is broad. Just yesterday in the in-person Sangha, someone had asked me, why should I sit up tall? You know, it's a good question. Why should you sit up with the spine long and the chest broad? Well, very simply, it helps with freshness and alertness. Without this structure, without this poise, meditation soon becomes drowsiness, boredom, and restlessness. So if you find that you're like getting sleepy or falling asleep in your meditation practice, it's because there's not enough, enough strength in your posture. 
You must imagine there is a string tied to the crown of your head and the string is gently pulling up towards the ceiling, creating a little bit of space in between each vertebral disc. And at the same time, you must imagine that your sits bones or like the very back of your pelvis is descending down into the floor. It's like you're being drawn up and down in both directions you are lengthening. As you climb the crown of the head towards the ceiling, the chin should come in slightly. You know, so Angela is demonstrating the posture here. You can see looking very strong here, tall spine, broad chest, but chin tucked. Then once we find strength in the pose, which is essential, without strength, there won't be stillness. Without stillness, there's no meditation. So see to it that you're sitting still. This is an act of will. And usually the moment you come into stillness, your face will itch. <laughs> You'll have the desire to move and shift and do something. You know, that's the body's resistance to stillness. So it takes will here to gently say, I am now in my pose. This is my asana. Asana is literally the mat that you're sitting on. It means seat. But metaphorically, asana is the meditation posture itself. The seat upon which your soul is sitting the seat upon which your conscious experience is premised, is based, which is right now the body. So see to it that the seat is firm, steady, and still. Always start your meditation practice with stira, steadiness, firmness, strength, poise, majesty. However you want to translate that Sanskrit word stira, it means willful, effortful strength. This is also the time to set like an intention, a sankalpa, you know, meaning you say to the mind, I am now meditating. I'm not sitting here. I'm not thinking. I'm not dawdling. I'm not escaping the task in my life. I am meditating. I am attempting now to sincerely contact that in me, which is sacred. I am attempting now to probe past all physicality and psychology, to glimpse, to contact, to experience that realm of the divine beyond all of those sensations, cognitions, etc. In the yoga vasishta, we are given a sankalpa. You say to your mind, oh mind, whatever you have to think about, I am not interested in. And what I am interested in, you cannot even begin to conceive of. In a Bengali song, it starts with, Oh, my mind, meditate continuously on the feet of the Lord Hari who sits upon the lotus of the heart. Like that, sankalpas are your own creation. You tell your mind to do this now. I'm meditating. So that's how we start. Then the second step is to relax. Once you have stira, firmness, length in the spine, space in the chest, once you have stira, it's time to introduce some sukha. Sukha means easefulness, comfort. Too much stira, too much strength, and you might find that this is not a sustainable practice. And of course, conversely, too much sukha, too much easefulness, too much permissibility will cause this to be a very drowsy, bored kind of lackluster practice. So it's got to be a balance. As you find length in the spine, space in the chest, also find some softness around the eyes, in the corners of the mouth, unclench the jaw. Soften the base of the neck, allowing your shoulders to come down away from your ears. And maybe even lean back slightly. Lean into the pose, settle into the pose, relax into the shape. All of this is true for those of you even lying down. So if you're lying down, you still tuck the chin in. You still climb the crown of the head up. You still scooch the outer edges of the shoulders under the back to create space across the chest. Even in Shavasana, note this carefully, there is stira. There must be a kind of structure to Shavasana. It's not just flopping onto the floor. It's a kind of, it's a pose. But it emphasizes the sukha aspect of just letting the breath flow naturally, letting the toes play open, the thighs roll open, letting the fingers soften and curl into the center of the palm and letting the body just release into the floor. So whether you are in corpse pose or in some kind of sukhasana or you know, seated cross-legged pose, 
See to it that you have stira and sukha. Now we'll begin with the mantra. If it feels appropriate, you might bring the hands over the heart. You might call to mind that which is sacred to you and offer this practice to that, whatever it might be. Ganapatim gam hava mahe kavin kavinam upama shavastamam jeshta rajam brahmanam brahmanaspata ana shrinva nutibihi sida sadhanam. O my invoker, divine gurus, Ganesh and Vishnu. I ask Ganesh, who is the lord of the circle, to take up his seat amidst our assembly that all things may be ordered, organized, and harmonized. Om Matma Tattva Shodhayami Swaha Om Vidya Tattva Shodhayami Swaha Om Shiva Tattva Shodhayami Swaha Om Sarva Tattva Shodhayami Swaha Om with the sacred mantra Swaha the mantra of consecration I sanctify purify and protect these three, sorry, these four elements, the self, atma, knowledge, vidya, the shiva tattva, pure being, consciousness, bliss. May all tattva, sarva tattva be thus purified. Om apavitra pavitrova sarvavastam katopiva Ya smaret pundari kaksham sa bhayabhyantraha suchihi. Whatever my condition might be internally or externally, by simply remembering the lotus eyed Lord, the one who is most beautiful, I become pure inside and out. Purity is internalization of the mind. The only impurity is an externalized mind. By remembering the Lord, my mind becomes inward seeking, and thus I am purified. No other standards of purity apply to me but this constant, remem constant remembrance of divinity. Om Namah Shivaya Satatam Panchakritya Vidhayane Chidananda Ganna Svatma Paramatava Basine Om Masatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityurma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Hi I invoke my Guru, the Lord Shiva, who alone is the dispeller of Shaktipat, who alone is the bestower of boons and grace, who alone is the Guru, who alone dwells within. Hail unto thee, Shiva, thou who art indeed awareness replete with joy, thou who art not different from my very own essence nature, thou who art the doer of the five divine acts of creation, maintenance, dissolution, self-revelation, and self-concealment. O Shiva, I pray to you, may this transmission happen by your grace, for you alone are the transmitter. I can of my own self do nothing. I empty myself out to you, Shiva. Om, lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from the darkness of ignorance unto the light of recognition. Lead us from death unto life everlasting. Om. Peace, peace, peace.
your own time, you may lower the hands and return to your meditation. We'll take the first step out of four. Begin by opening your eyes. And step one is to notice the world around you. So you might look around, noticing the various objects in this space, noticing the textures and contours and forms of this room, noticing the body in which you feel yourself to be sitting in, and just noticing that there is a basic instinct, like a kind of intuitive feeling that there is a world. Like all around you, there are other people, there are things, there are other places, there's this whole world. Not just the plants and chairs and animals in your room, but also the plants all around you, the trees in your neighborhood, in your country, in your nation, the vast forests in the forest reserves, and the wild untrammeled forests of like South America and all over Southeast Asia, like all of that. So many forests, jungles, so dense with vegetation. Notice that so many animals, like insects, untold varieties of insects live in these forests. You know, untold varieties of birds and creepers and flowers and animals and all that. There's so much richness of life and being in the forests. And also so many cities. Think about all the cities in the world. There's so many people that live in these cities. All of them have one or at least at least one, but probably several cars. Think about how many cars there are on the highway right now, all trying to get to some place, all rushing this way and that, honking and you know, listening to whatever it is they're listening to on, 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 on their radios or podcasts or whatever like that. So many people, so many cars, so many buildings. People are leaving buildings, going to buildings. So many comings and goings in the city. So many sounds. It all feels so real, no? There are cities, there are jungles, there are vast swaths of land. And that's to say nothing of the cosmos beyond this mere earth. Oh, there are so many planets with gaseous oceans and explosions and supernovas happening everywhere. The oh, solar system is swimming along in an ocean of milk. There are so many other solar systems wheeling about in this same ocean of milk. It's a galaxy, and it too is in contact with other galaxies, whirling about the center of a supercluster or what have you with a black hole in the middle and all of that is going on. So many things, you know, all about you. So consider that for a bit. Just the scope of it all. Cities, jungles, the earth, the solar system, the galaxy, the Milky Way, you know, think of the clusters, the superclusters, all of it. All the stardust. Consider it now. Just take a moment to appreciate the vastness of the world. This will be a very flippant exercise, this destroying of the world, if it didn't start with the most inclusive definition of the word world. So the degree to which you can now conceive of and contemplate upon the vastness of the cosmos around you is the degree to which this exercise will be beneficial, successful, or transformative. More important than this, mere intellectual conception of the vastness of the world, is the felt sense of being this person, one small fleck in this otherwise gargantuan and inexplicable universe. Just be with that feeling for a while. Not so much the thought, but be with the feeling that the thought produces. You are just this one person, so small, so insignificant, right? Here you are in the midst of it all, in the midst of your room, which is but one part of your house which is but one part of the street, which is but one part of the neighborhood, which is but one part of the country, etc., etc. Like that, just take a moment to dwell upon your own seeming insignificance. Note that all of us carry around this basic, well, I'm going to call it an error, but for most of us it's not yet an error, this basic felt sense of being this particular person inside a world of other people and things, etc. So meditate on that sense for a few moments. Mm. 
Now notice what this sense of being a person in the world does for you in terms of its consequences. As long as you consider yourself to be this person in a world, notice that there are other people that you like and other people that you don't like. So there are some people that you'd like to have special relationships with, some people that you'd like to get closer to, and other people that you'd like to avoid and remove from your life. Now notice, the people that you want to avoid often inevitably show up. And the people that you want to get close to, sometimes frustratingly, don't want to be close to you or leave through death or falling out of love or something. So if there are other people in the world, there's always going to be some kind of struggle and strain. Running away from some people and trying to get closer to other people. And notice, even if you're close to someone, there's a limit to how close you can be. It's never quite enough. Intellectual and emotional intimacy still makes for something of a gulf between you and the person, however much you achieve that intimacy. So you might have noticed that. Anyway, notice that there are also things. As long as you are this person in a world of other things, there are things that you want, that you want to bring into your life, that you might feel like are difficult to get. And there are things that you don't want that might inevitably come into your life anyway. So consider all the events, circumstances, people and things of life become desirable or undesirable insofar as you nurse this basic assumption of being a person in a world. So Shiva is the destroyer of the world. He is also the destroyer of illusion. Which is it? Does Shiva destroy illusions such as false thought constructs allowing you to live in the world in a more productive way? Or does Shiva destroy the world itself? Because that would include all thought constructs, positive or negative. So what does Shiva do? Does Shiva just destroy negative thought constructs, leaving you with your positive ones? Or does Shiva destroy all thoughts? Does he destroy all emotions? Does he destroy the entire world? So dwell on this for a few moments. Shiva is both the destroyer of the world and the dispeller of illusion. Taken together, these two premises indicate a wonderful conclusion. The world itself is the illusion. All of it. This feeling of being a person in a world, surrounded by jungles and cities and other people and things, is the basic delusion, the error. It is this alone that causes you to experience any form of suffering, from the mildest feeling of remorse or FOMO to the most intense grief of losing what you love. All of it is premised on this feeling of being a particular person surrounded by other people and things. So if you remove this basic premise of being a particular person in the world, what are you left with? Who can say? You must find out. That is Shiva's grace. But the way Shiva does this is by destroying the world. So let's do that right now. We'll move into the second stage of our meditation. And what you might even say is the first stage of this practice. We are going to dissolve the gross into the subtle. So we'll start with something gross now. Open your eyes. I mean gross not in the sense of ew, but in the sense of physical. Open your eyes and look at something, anything. And let your eyes rest upon that object for a few moments. Now consider this carefully. Say the object you're looking at is a table, whatever it might be. A table, a chair, a, 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 hopefully something static because it's easier to keep your eyes on that. Uh, if you're looking at this, consider this carefully. Let's say it's a table. Are you experiencing a table? Or are you experiencing seeing a table? This might sound incredibly trivial. So this is incredibly trivial for many people. But for us, herein lies our freedom. Look carefully at this point. Is there a table in front of you? Or is there not some experience called seeing a table? It's more likely the latter. 
You have never experienced anything in this world directly. You've only ever experienced your own perception of it. So even if you are to assert that there is a world out there, you would never be able to experience it directly outside of yourself without your sensual perceptive mechanisms. And as such, this representative reality doesn't make any sense. You can't verify such a world out there. All you have access to right now are your perceptions of the world around you, your perceptions of other people, other things, cities, jungles, cosmos, all of it must be reduced to perception because you have no access to anything beyond that. So now you may close your eyes. If you want. And now listen. Perform the same activity now with listening. You might be able to hear some sounds coming from outside your window. Focus on any one of them. And now as you listen to something, maybe it's like a car siren or the sound of traffic or something like that. So listen carefully to this sound coming from outside your window or from some other room or somewhere outside of yourself. And again ask yourself, are you experiencing traffic? Or are you merely experiencing your hearing of traffic in the distance? Notice it's the latter. What you are hearing, or rather what you are experiencing is not traffic, what you are experiencing is hearing. All of traffic is just hearing. All sounds are just the experience of hearing. Just like you noticed earlier, all things are just the experience seeing. You can do this, of course, now with your skin feeling, noticing that your clothes, your body, your atmosphere, all of it is nothing more than touching, feeling. So in puja, we use a mantra here, actually. The mantra is pat. And often what you do is you tap fingers into your palms. You don't have to do this. I'll do it for you. But it sounds like this. Pat. The idea now is to use that mantra. Pat. To dissolve or reduce the entire world to perception. In the way that we just did. Take a few moments to meditate on that now. That the entire world around you is nothing but perception. You have no access to anything outside of that anyway. As you meditate on this, you would have transitioned from your experience of the gross into your experience of the subtle. You would have moved from Bu Loka to something like Buar Loka. Not exactly, but in a kind of poetic way. If you now notice the world around you is actually being experienced internally in you, you're experiencing the subtle aspect of the world. What maybe yogis might call Tan Matras. Not quite, but something like it. So feel how your hearing, your seeing, your tasting, your touching, these are all internal experiences. They're all subtle experiences. And more importantly, they're more intimate. Hearing, seeing, tasting, these are all things that you are experiencing within. They're not so extroverted as some chair or some table or some person out there. So as you meditate on this, notice then that everybody you've ever seen is already in you. Everything you've ever known is actually in you. Where else could it be?
Notice that everything is in space. All the jungles we talked about, all the cities, all the people, all of it is in space. But have you ever experienced space objectively apart from your own experiencing? Anytime you've ever experienced anything, it's been in space. And anytime you've experienced space, it's been internally in the mind. So if everything is in space and space is in the mind, then everything is in you. You should feel now a sense of vastness. Your concept of you should expand beyond just the body and mind sitting in a room and it should include and encompass the room, the neighborhood, the country, the globe, the solar system, all of it. Feel it all as a kind of floating experience within you. You might say, well, I don't know what's happening in Alpha Centauri right now. Fine. Both knowing and not knowing are within you. Even the concept Alpha Centauri, some faraway distant universe, is there. I mean, star is there in you. Now we go to something even higher. So we're going now to the second stage. Now we're moving from the subtle to the causal. Transcending now even the subtle all your inner experiences, these subtle perceptions, these emotions, these thoughts, these concepts, all of it, is it not being experienced by you, the witness of it all? Without you, the witness, could there be any of these perceptions? Could there be a mind at all with its subtle experiences of thought, emotion, perception? Notice that you, the witness, are the cause of all of these. In the sense that without you, they wouldn't be there. All these perceptions that you're experiencing now, all the thoughts and emotions that are present in the field of your experience, all of them depend on you for their being. Without you, they would not be sensed, experienced, any of that. So in precisely this way, we mean to say this witness is causal. It's the causal aspect of you, the pure eye sense. And it creates everything. Now, not only that, but it also maintains everything. If you're not aware of something, it might not actually even exist. At least not for you. It might exist for others, but you don't know that. In your own experience, if you've withdrawn your attention from something, it dissolves. Kind of like a limb that you don't use for a while, ultimately it will atrophy and fade away. Similarly, a thought that you don't energize with your attention also atrophies and fades away. Think of some, for instance, obsessive thoughts that you might have had three years ago. You might not actually even be thinking about them anymore. You notice that there was a time when you thought about them a lot. You revitalized them with your attention each and every day. And as long as you did that, they stayed in your experience. The moment you withdrew your attention, they dissolved. So just like that, notice that it's your attention that is maintaining any of these experiences in your world right now. You are the ground of all being. You created all of it. And you are maintaining all of it with the power of your attention. And now we can go to the third and final stage. This is the stage of Shiva. This is the Tandava, the, da the dance of destruction that ultimately dissolves it all. You have gone from the gross to the subtle. You've gone from the subtle to the causal. Now all three is to be offered like a fire offering into the Homa pit of Shiva. Throw it all into the fire of pure consciousness. There, there is no word, no concept. All of these are just but signposts. They are not the thing in and of itself. For it is not a thing. It is a no thing. It is not Anything you can point to, it is the one pointing. It is beyond even that I sense that you felt on the causal plane. It is the emitter of that I, more you than you've ever known yourself to be. The innermost, it can never be known, but it can be more than known, as Swami Vivekananda said. Feel for that now. No words will help you here. I must leave you to it. The fire of Shiva. Rest in it. Dissolve into it. 
the whole world is dissolved into it. The degree to which you can feel yourself to be this oneness, this awareness, is the degree to which you have become Shiva. You are ultimately Shiva. Not you, the individual, the conscious knower, the pramata. Yes, in one sense, yes, but no. Here we mean you, the, the capital Y, you, the self. Pure awareness, replete with joy. Notice if this feels beautiful or meaningful or deep in any way. What we have done is called involution. From this awareness comes the causal world of I, that basic I sense. From that comes the subtle world of thoughts and emotions and perceptual mechanisms like seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting. And from that comes the world, the gross. So from this fourth state comes first the causal state, then the subtle state, then the gross state. The gross state is the least real of them all. The subtle state is slightly higher in this hierarchy of reality. The causal is the most real that you can experience. And this is beyond experience, this fourth state, this turiya. It's beyond all experience. Now, some of you might like to just stay here. You know, after the puja this afternoon, giving Kali her meal. I had this sense that this is what we should do. Although typically on Wednesdays, we do poses. We do all sorts of Hatha Yoga poses. And somehow Mother seemed like she wanted a different kind of dance. She almost said today, first and foremost, you must speak of Antara Mukha, inward facingness. How can they dance if they do not drink of the wine that is pure consciousness? Their dance will not have ecstasy. It will be but formal and methodical. The form might be nice, and I'm delighted by that, but I want to see a dance. So I said, Mother, how shall we dance? What shall we do? What poses, you know, do you want to see? And typically before these classes we do, I do a puja, you know, just so that. And almost it was like this feeling of, no, no, don't instruct any poses. Who are you? I don't know anything. You don't even know how to do the poses. Why, you should, why should you tell anybody what poses they should do? You've never done a pose, she said to me. Not once. She smiles and said, everything is cute. All these poses are cute. You know? I appreciate them all the same. But grow up a bit. You know? As a baby, I, you make me some Nutella sandwich. I love it. But now you're an adolescent. You know to cook. Maybe cook something a little better. And to do that, you must go deep. You must contact this non-discursive, pre-conceptual field of pure knowing within you. And then the poses should arise out of that. Only then the Hatha Yoga practice is a dance. Only then is it an offering to Kali. So, in keeping with that, those of you who would like to simply stay in meditation, simply lie down, and be with this meditation, you know, you can refresh the steps, go from gross to subtle to causal, and then keep trying to, and it's not trying, it's the opposite of trying, but keep surrendering to that one. The tad, the that, you the, the, can't even say anything there. And of course, I am keeping my commitment to Kali, but also to you, for you are more Kali to me than anything. And also on Wednesday, I know our commitment is to practice some Hatha Yoga. So those of you who would like to move, to do some poses, if it's important to you, I want to honor that. And so I will cue some poses now. They're completely optional. You're welcome to just stay with this meditation. Or if you'd like to do some poses, if you're seated upright, you might inhale and take the arms up through the sides. That's perfectly optional and superfluous. Taking the arms up through the sides. Relax the base of the neck, soften the shoulders down away from the ears, reach up through the fingertips and curl the upper outer arms in towards the face. Exhale, bring the hands down. So like that, we'll go a couple of times. Inhaling, bringing the hands up through the sides of the body. Exhaling, bringing the hands down. The idea is to widen your wingspan. 
you know, so taking the arms up into the air, reaching through the fingertips, curling the upper outer arms into the face, exhale, bringing the hands down, reaching through the tips of the fingers, broadening across the chest, inhaling, taking the arms up through the sides, and please sit in any cross-legged pose that is comfortable to you. Taking the arms up. This time, as you take your arms all the way up, pause there and bring the left fingertips to the floor on your left and start to walk the left fingertips out to the left and take a sideways bend, bending over to the left. Now, your right hip is going to want to come up off the ground. You know, even very subtly, but try to keep that right hip down. So it's more important that the right hip stays rooted than it is that you go lower. So this might be all that you do. That's okay. And if you come down lower, yeah, do it, but make sure it's not compromising this hip. So if you feel like bringing the left elbow down, you can, but notice already my hip is coming up. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stay on my palm. You might stay on your fingertips. In any case, take your lateral stretch, relax the shoulders down away from the ears and roll the right ribs back. So you're rolling the torso open and maybe you gaze up, straighten the elbow of the lifted arm, tuck the chin in, and curl the upper outer arm down towards your face. Inhale, come back up. Beautifully done. Feel all that spaciousness. Now you look like a tantric deity with a slight curve in your you know, uh, spine. So bring that right hand down, walk the right fingertips over to the right, and again, roll the left ribs back. Roll the left upper outer arm down. It's like spinning your pinky side of the hand down, rolling the top ribs back, keep the chin tucked and gaze up at that left arm. Left arm is straight, so there's a line of energy moving through that arm, rolling the top ribs back. Mm. And Kalima says always to smile. There is always, the final cue is to lift the um, corners of the lips up slightly. And she is always smiling. <laughs> You'll never see Kalima not smiling, even when she slays demons. It's funny, it's fun to her. <laughs> Inhale, bring the hands up. <laughs> bring the left finger tips down to the floor now, and again, take that sideways stretch. And we're going to do um, a dance. So from this left sideways stretch, inhale, come back up, and exhale, go to the right sideways stretch. Rolling the top ribs back, go side. Inhale, come back up. Climb through the crown of the head, lengthen the spine. Exhale, come down to the side. Rolling the top ribs open. Inhale, come back up. Remember to keep the right hip pinned as you go to the left. Exhale to the right. Keep the left hip pinned down as you go to the right. Tucking the chin, maybe looking up. Inhale, come back up to center. And one last time, exhale. Maybe you can go a little bit lower as you start to open up some more space in the side of the torso. Inhale, come back up. Climb the crown of the head towards the ceiling. Exhale, bring the right fingertips down. Go over to the right. Roll the top ribs back. Yes. And now inhale, come back up. And this time we'll take a twist. So reach the arms up, relax the shoulders down, spine long and tall. Exhale, bring the left fingertips to the floor behind you. Right hand comes to the left knee. Twist over to the left. Remember to relax the shoulders. And if the neck allows, you might gaze over your left shoulder at the space behind you. Inhale, bring the hands up towards the sky. Exhale, take the left, sorry, left hand to the right knee. Take the right hand behind the sacrum and twist over now to the other side, to the right. Relax the shoulders and if the neck allows, gaze over the right shoulder. Inhale, take the arms up into the air. And interestingly enough, on an exhale, we twist. So you might like to add a mantra to it. So as you exhale, you might mentally recite Om, oh, mentally, or better yet, Om Kreem Kalikaye Devye Namaha. So exhale, bring that 
Um, left hand to the floor, exhaling your mantra. You know, whatever you like. You might have, you know, you, many of you have been initiated into a mantra. Use that. And if you haven't, Om is good. Kriing is good. Take your arms up into the air. Exhale. Or just simply Jai Ma Kali. Exhaling, going to the other side. So what is Kali? She is the body with all of its energies, exuberant and dynamic. She is the breath moving up and down the spine in five flows. Inhale, take the arms up into the air. She is the senses constantly being nourished by contact with the world. Exhale, and she is that very world. The appearance of every chair, table, every person. Inhale, take the arms up into the air. Exhale. So Jai Ma Kali is a lot like the mantra Aham, which means something like I am or Ah or Yes or Mmm. Pure existence. How beautiful. Take the arms up into the air and this time fold forward. So bringing the hands down to the floor, melting the belly into the shins, bringing the forehead flat to the floor. And if the floor seems too far away, bring some blocks. Where are my blocks? Oh, well. Bring some blocks or a pillow or something like that and you can bring the forehead down to the pillow or to the blocks or to what have you. The idea now is to feel the shoulder blades spreading apart. Feel the middle and upper back stretching. And as you feel all that sensation arising from the outer hips, yes, this is a hip opener. So as you feel the sensation arising from the outer hips, in the back also, notice it's such life, so much exuberance. It allows you to say, Jai Ma Kali. Jai Ma Kali. Victory, victory unto Kali. What is Kali? Kala. Well, there's a lot of wordplay here. Kala means something like space. Or Desha and Kala means something like space. Kala means time. Um, but also in Sanskrit, there is this root, kal. And that root is the root of many words in the Sanskrit language that have something to do with like to conceive of. You know, so for instance, when Prabodha, a great Krama master, you know, from the lineage of the Kali worshipping Krama school, when he wrote this poem, Oh, there is nothing that I can conceive of that is so transcendent that is not completely transcended by you. But nor is there anything I can conceive of that is so low, that is not completely saturated by you. Who is the you? We, we don't really know in the poem because he doesn't say a name. He doesn't say Vishnu or Shiva or anybody, you know? He doesn't say a name. But the wordplay here is interesting. He uses the, the conceive, that English word conceive. Uh, and the root there in Sanskrit is kal. So we can kind of intimate his meaning. Like we know he has in mind Kali. So Kali then is all the possible things you can conceive of. She is the stuff out of which every thought, every emotion, every perception is made. So if the gross world reduces to the subtle, and if the subtle reduces to the causal, then the causal reduces to Kali. She is the ground of all being, pure awareness, pure consciousness. All right, let's come out of this pose. Slowly walk the hands back, come out. And now let's change the cross of the legs. You know, so however your legs were crossed just now, change the cross, so do the other way now. And then fold forward once more. So exhaling, folding forward, changing the cross of your legs, taking one more forward fold, just to even out the hip opening on either side.
And when you're ready, you can come out of that. Walking the hands out of that pose. And a few options. You can come into meditation now. You can go into Shavasana now. We'll only be another 15 or 10, 10 or so minutes. So if you'd like to end now and just stay with it, you can. But if you'd like to do some more poses, I'll just offer a few more here. A little bit more of a fluid and dynamic sequence. So coming out of this meditation pose, coming onto the hands and knees and taking your cow cat. Inhaling to cow, exhaling, tucking the chin, lifting the belly into the spine, spreading the shoulder blades apart. So this should be a kind of ecstatic and creative movement. Inhale to drop the belly, lift the chin, press into the palms, arms are straight. Jaw is relaxed, cow. Exhale, tuck the chin, rounding the upper back, lifting the belly into the spine, cat. Inhale, lifting the chin, arching the upper back, press the shoulder blades into the back. Exhale, tucking the chin. Now feel free to add circular motions to this. Inhaling to cow, exhaling to cat in any kind of configuration that you like. So again, this is an offering, meaning form is not as important as feeling. As we said in our opening mantra, he whosoever remembers the Lord, of course that's Kali, that's Shiva, that's whoever, becomes pure through and through. There is no other standard of purity but this. Inhale, cow, exhale, tucking the chin, rounding the upper back, cat. And when you're ready, you can tuck the toes, lift the hips, coming into downward facing dog. Wrap the upper outer arms down and under towards the ears as you did just now. You might bend the knees, lift the hips a smidgen higher, and exhale, grounding the heels, firming the thighs, spinning the inner edge of the thighs back towards the wall behind you. Inhale will bring you forward now to Plank pose, Ardha Chaturanga Dandasana. Legs are firm, thighs firm, belly lifted, elbows straight, but everything is soft. Breath is soft, jaw is soft, diaphragm is soft. Exhale, lift the hips back to downward facing dog. Feel all that life and juice coursing up through the backs of your legs as you take this most ecstatic of poses, like bowing down to the divine. Inhale, come forward to plank. Climb the crown of the head forward, shoulder heads back. Exhale back to downward facing dog. Press through the thumb and first finger. You might even revolve the palms outward slightly in order to press down with the inner edge of the palm. Inhale, come forward to tabletop. And this time shift the shoulders ahead of the wrist and start lowering down. Maybe to Chaturanga, maybe you can lower down thighs, chest, face. Press the backs of the feet to the floor. Inhale will take you up to Bhujangasana Cobra. Shoulders down and back, thighs firm, knees lifted, chin in. Exhale, tucks the toes, lifts the hips, takes you back to downward facing dog. So all of this should be very fluid and beautiful, like fun. You're doing it just as an offering to Kali, a dance. Inhale, coming forward, taking your um, Ardha Chaturanga Dandasana plank pose. Shifting the shoulders forward, lowering down, maybe like a push-up. Inhale, press the backs of the feet down. Maybe this time you take up dog. Pelvis lifted, thighs lifted. Or you take cobra. Both are fine. Exhale, tuck the toes, lift the hips. Downward facing dog. And just to complete a round of three, the three-spoke trident of Kali and Shiva. Inhale, come forward, take plank pose one last time. Shift the shoulders forward. Exhale, elbows in, lower down. Inhale, press the backs of the feet into the floor, tucking the chin, shoulders down and back, lifting the chest forward and up, as if to thread the sternum through the biceps, and then exhale, go back to downward facing dog. And then bring the sh uh, knees to the floor, sink the belly into the thighs, sink the hips into the heels, take child's pose. You might make a pillow with your forearms for the forehead, you might reach the arms back or you might do anything else that is inspiring and ennobling to you. Now 
of course, if more poses come to you, remember that this is your practice. A whole day is your practice. You can do whatever you want. Once someone asked, if I don't become a nun or a monk, can I still live like one? Can I still observe the vows of chastity and poverty? Can I still spend all of my days in prayer, contemplation, meditation? You know? Do I have to, like, I don't know, become a householder and do all of that? I mean, you know, is there an in-between? And my guru smiled and laughed and said, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> if you join up and you decide to be a nun or a monk and you decide it's not for you, you can leave. You know? If you decide after getting married and having children that it's not for you, you can become a monk. A lot of people have done that. And the wife and child and husband, they often understand. You know? So this world is yours. In terms of spiritual practice, you have all of these years ahead of you, God willing, and you at least have this moment. You can do with it whatever you want to do with it. It's ultimately all her play anyway. So it's fun. Wherever you are in the spiritual path is just where she wants to be, Kali. For she is none other than you experiencing this miracle that is your life. So honoring where we are, noting that we can walk through any door from this point on. If you want to be initiated to a Kali Mantra, take up Kali Puja daily. You know, if you want to start meditating in a tantric form, talk to me. We'll, we'll see how we can sort you out with the mantra. You know, if you want to go to a Soto or Rinzai Zen school and practice 16 hours a day in the Zen style, learning about Buddha nature, do that. And you can learn from all. Ultimately, whichever path you choose to walk and however you choose to walk it and however long you choose to take on the journey, we all get to the same place, which is the dissolution of the gross world into the subtle, the dissolution of the subtle into the causal, and finally, the complete surrendering of the causal into that which is beyond all three and cannot be named. So I'm going to close this class now. Um, by inviting you into either Shavasana or meditation. Shavasana might be nice, but if you prefer to sit upright, you can. And I'll read to you um, just a few verses from the Shiva Stotra Vali, which um, translates to the Garland of Hymns to Shiva by the great master Utpala Deva, kind of like a lineage founder. So to just close this class now, here are a few select phrases, or at least a few select verses from the Sarvatma Paribhavana Stotra, which translates to contemplating the all in all. I will read to you from the Swami Lakshmanju translation. Vibrama Vishnu Stavara Jangama Swarupa Bahurupaya Nama Sangvin Mayayate. O Lord Shiva, you are the fire. You have possessed subjective consciousness. You are the moon. You have possessed objective consciousness. You are the sun. You have possessed cognitive consciousness. You are subjective. You are objective. And you are cognitive. You are Brahma, the creator. You are Vishnu, the protector also. You are animate and you are inanimate also. Although you are universal, you are above universal. You are only consciousness. I bow to thy universal form. Vishve, Vishvendana Mahakshara Nule Pashu Chivarchase Mahanalaya Bhavate 
Vishvaikaha Vishenamaha. O Lord, I bow to that supreme fire of thy consciousness, which is absolutely glorified by pure light, by absorbing, absorbing this universe into nothingness. By burning this universe into ashes, you absorb those ashes in your self-consciousness. And by that, your light is glorified all around. This universe becomes just one offering in that fire of God consciousness. By the way, this word is both consciousness of God and God that is consciousness. So God consciousness, it's wordplay. Goddess awareness, you could say. It is not offered in the fire a second time. In one swaha only it is finished. This universe becomes one swaha in one moment, one offering. I bow to that supreme fire of Lord Shiva. The author, Utpala Deva, has nominated Lord Shiva as great fire, great abode of fire in which this whole universe has been destroyed and burnt to ashes. Those ashes are the traces of the impressions that remain in consciousness. When you destroy the whole universe by your way of devotion, still those traces that there was some universe in that previous state remain. So I will skip now to the very end, the final verse. Just to give you a sense of the texture of of what it's like to be enlightened in this tradition of Shaiva Yoga. So this is verse 20, the second to last verse of the Charva Na Bididana Stotra, the final hymn. Tatva ka bhakti rasasa vase ka diva sukkitamar Sukita marmam mandala spuritai Nrityati virajano nishi Veta lakulai kritto saha Veta lakulahi kritto saha O Lord, glorified and shining with the sprinkling of the nectar of thy devotion having overcome the multitude of the nooses of the differentiated perception, inspired by the collection of the ghosts of the sense organs, with the lotuses of their hearts fully bloomed, having conquered the universe, thy devotees dance in ecstasy in the dark night of the illusion of Maya itself. Those heroes drink the liquor of thy devotion, encouraged by those nine ghosts, and they dance in the graveyard. Arad Pabava da Binutira Muna Yenanga Kena Mama Shambho Tena Paryanta Mi Mam Kalam Virdamakila Me Bavishta. In the end, there is one request that I have before you, O Lord. I have composed these glorious hymns. With what ambition have I composed them? That does not have to be known. My only desire, my only request, is that you should bestow me the sensation in which I should always sing your glory for my whole lifetime. Itti Shivam. All this is verily Shiva. May it be a blessing. I'm going to chant and close the meeting, so please rest. The time now is 3.18 in California. Thank you for coming. Om Ishvara Nugraha Deva Pumsam Advaita Vasana Mahadbhaya Paritranat Vipranam Upajayate Om Shanti 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 Hi Hari Hi Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Arpanamastu